chemist isolates compound L with an empirical formula of C3H6O and sends a sample for analysis. The analytical laboratory sends back the following spectra. So we've been told that we have a mass spectrum with a molecular iron peak at mass over charge ratio 116.0. And we're given some proton NMR spectra. We've got one with no D2O and we've got one with D2O added. We are also told that the numbers next to each signal represent the number of protons responsible for that signal overall. And we can see our splitting patterns and we've got our chemical shift values. We are also given a carbon-13 NMR spectrum and we need to use all of this information provided to suggest a structure for compound L. So let's start by working out the formula of our compound L so that we can start to comprise a structure. So we've been told that our empirical formula is C3H6O and we've been given the molecular iron peak from our mass spectrum. And we can use this data to therefore work out what our molecular formula is. So our molecular iron peak is the same as the MR for the compound. So what we need to do is work out what the empirical mass is and then see if this is the same as the molecular mass or if it's a different factor. So our empirical mass is going to be 3 lots of 12 plus 6 lots of 1 for the hydrogen plus 16 and this is equal to 58. So then if we divide 116 by 58 we can see that we've got a factor of 2. Therefore we need to multiply our entire empirical formula by 2 to get our molecular formula. So therefore our molecular formula is going to be c 6 h 12 2 So we worked out already that our molecular formula is C6H12O2. So now let's have a look at our carbon NMR spectrum so that we can get a bit more information about our structure. So with our carbon NMR spectrum, the number of peaks is equal to the number of carbon environments there. So what we can see on our spectrum is that we've got five different peaks overall. So we've got five peaks on our spectrum. Therefore, we've got five different carbon environments. And because we've got six carbons in our compound, what this tells us is that we've got to have some situation where two different carbons are in the same environment. So some aspect of symmetry, for example, maybe something like this, where you've got two carbons bonded to the same carbon, where they're in an identical environment there. So now, if we look at the peaks and their chemical shift values, we can start to work out a little bit more about the carbon environments within our compound. So the peaks on the right-hand side of the spectrum are going to be from alkyl chains overall. And these are going to be relatively shielded, which is why they appear on this right-hand side. But we've got one peak here on the left-hand side, which is very de-shielded. And this peak, which corresponds a chemical shift value of 213 ppm. If we have a look at that on our data sheet, this corresponds to the carbon from a carbonyl bond overall. Now we don't know whether this is going to be from an aldehyde or a ketone at this stage, or even potentially a carboxylic acid. But what we do know is that we've got that carbonyl bond there. So now what we've worked out is that we've got five carbon environments and that we've got a carbonyl bond from the peak at 213 parts per million there on our carbon-13 NMR spectrum. So now let's have a look at our proton NMR spectra so that we can put our structure of compound L together. So we've got two spectra here. We've got a normal proton NMR spectrum run in a normal solvent 
and we've got a proton and a mass spectrum where D2O has been added. So deuterium is an isotope of hydrogen and it's a heavier isotope of hydrogen. And when you add D2O to your compound and then run your spectrum, the deuterium replaces any protons which are bonded to either an oxygen or a nitrogen. So some sort of either alcohol group or amine group we're focusing on here. And due to the properties within the nucleus of the deuterium, it does not show up on an NMR spectrum once it replaces the protons bonded to oxygens or nitrogens. So what this means effectively is if you're comparing these two spectrums together, if you do have either an alcohol group or an amine group within your compound, when you look at the spectra with D2O added, the peak responsible for either your alcohol or your amine will disappear because that hydrogen has been replaced by deuterium, so it no longer shows up in the NMR spectrum. So thinking about our compound specifically, we had our molecular formula C6H12O2, so we're only really thinking about the potential of an alcohol group in this compound. And what we can see is if we compare our two spectra, we've got five peaks when we've got no D2O. And when we've added our D2O, one of our peaks has disappeared. So it's this little peak here that's disappeared that was originally responsible for one hydrogen and it's disappeared when the D2O has been added. So this tells us that this peak here is responsible for the hydrogen bonded to an oxygen in an alcohol group there. So now let's start to look at the environments and the splitting for the other peaks so that we can get the rest of our structure. I'm just going to be working off the bottom spectra because there's a slightly bit more space there. So let's work left to right here. So with our peak at around about 3.8 ppm, we've got a triplet and we've been told that this represents two hydrogens. And if you look in your data sheet, the environment which corresponds at around about 3.8 ppm is when you've got a proton that's bonded to a carbon that is single bonded to an oxygen. So we're looking at this proton here, this one. But because we've been told that this represents two protons within this environment, there must be two different hydrogens. So this is what our environment looks like for this situation. And therefore, if we've got for our carbon two bonds to hydrogen, a bond to an oxygen, then that means that this carbon must be bonded to another carbon. So that's going to be our first look. And now if we take a little look at the splitting, we can see that we've got a triplet. And from the n plus one rule, we know that n represents the number of different hydrogens bonded to the adjacent carbon there. And then you just add one on and that's going to be your splitting pattern for that particular environment and that peak. So because we've got a triplet, if we take away one, that means that there must be two hydrogens bonded to the adjacent carbon. Therefore, we can put two hydrogens in here. And now we can see our full view for that environment overall. So I'm just circling the hydrogens which are in this environment. Now, the next peak along is not in this spectrum with the D2O added, but we identified it on the spectrum above. This is going to be our OH. So now looking at the next peak along, we've got this peak here, which is at around about 3.1 parts per million there. And we can see that we've got another triplet, and this also is representing two hydrogens. So if we want to think about the particular environment for this one, this chemical shift value, if you look on your data sheet, corresponds to hydrogen, which is bonded to a carbon, which is then bonded to a carbonyl bond like so.
And because we've got two hydrogens in this environment, that must mean that we've got to add another hydrogen in there like so. So we've got the two hydrogens in this environment here. So now let's have a look at the splitting pattern so that we can build up the rest of that environment. So we've got a triplet and referring back to our n plus one rule, that must mean that we've got two hydrogens on an adjacent carbon. Therefore, because we can't add hydrogen, two hydrogens onto this carbon here, this tells us that we've got another carbon with two hydrogens bonded on like this. Now, there is a potential to have a hydrogen here, and we could have an aldehyde, or this could be bonded to a carbon and could be a ketone. So we'll leave it at this for now, and then we can always come back and modify our structure later on if need be. So the next peak then, which we want to look at, is this one here. So we've got our multiplet here, or from the zoomed in, we can see we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So that's going to be a septet, and that's at around about 2.7 ppm there. And we're told that this represents one hydrogen. So this chemical shift value is actually very close to our previous peak. And that's because we've actually got the same environment overall. So what we've got is we've got a hydrogen that's bonded to a carbon that's bonded to a carbonyl bond. So we've got the same thing as before, but we've got a slightly different situation going on. So we're looking at a different environment, but appearing at the same chemical shift due to the hydrogen being bonded to a carbon bonded to that carbonyl bond. But this time, we've told that this environment only contains just the one hydrogen here. Therefore, this carbon must be bonded to other carbons. And supporting this fact is that we've got a septet here. So using our n plus one rule, what that must mean is that our carbon is bonded to carbons which are bonded to six hydrogens. And there's only one way which we can get that to work with our bonding, and that's by having two methyl groups bonded there to that carbon. So therefore, this carbon has now got two adjacent carbons, each containing three hydrogens. That's two lots of three, that makes six. You add one and you get seven there. So that matches up with our septet. So looking at our last peak now, we've got a doublet representing six hydrogens at a ppm value of around about 1.1 or 1 ppm there. So we've got that doublet representing six hydrogens. And if we have a look on this structure here, which we just drew out, that must be from these hydrogens here. So they're hydrogens and they're in the same environment. So I'll just underline those in purple. And this is going to correspond then to those hydrogens there. And that matches up with our symmetry aspect, which we mentioned when we're going through the carbon 13 NMR spectrum. Now, the last thing to look at before we move on to building up our structure is what's happened to the rest of this carbonyl bond. So I said previously that this carbon, we can see we've only got three bonds there. And that's the case with a few of these different chunks because we've got to actually build up our molecule. But this carbon can either be bonded to a hydrogen or a carbon in this situation. However, if it was going to be bonded to a hydrogen, we would see another peak in our spectrum. And we'd be seeing a peak at around about 9 or 10 ppm if that was an aldehyde. However, we don't have that peak. Therefore, this tells us that we've got a ketone. So this carbon is bonded to another carbon there. So now we can put together all of this information to start to think about our structure. So building up our structure now, what we know is that if this carbonyl bond must be a ketone, then this carbon has to be bonded to another carbon. So that would then therefore make sense if this was the other side of that. So we've got our carbonyl bond in the middle, 
this section one side and this section other side. And then now if we compare this section to this section here, we must have these two being the same. And therefore we've got this at the end with our OH, which we identified from before. So now let's draw this out in full and think about where we can get the marks for this question. So we identified that we have that carbonyl bond and to the one side we had a carbon which was bonded to two methyl groups. That's where they've got two carbons and two hydrogens in the same environment. And then that carbon also had a hydrogen bonded to it. And then to the other side of that carbonyl bond, we had two CH2s. And then we had an alcohol group. So let's count up our numbers of atoms and check that it matches up with our molecular formula. So we've got one, two, three, four, five, six carbons. We've got one, two oxygens. And for our hydrogens, we've got six, seven, nine, 11, 12. So that all matches up with our molecular formula. And just reflecting back on our carbon NMR, we've, let's check how many carbon peaks we've got. So for our carbon environments, we've got one, two, three, four, and then these two carbons are in the same environment. So we've got five overall. And it's always a good idea with these questions to go back and check at the end that you've got the right number of environments to match up with your peaks. Because sometimes when we look in at the details, we forget that when we're slotting things back together, that we need to get things the right way round and bonded the right way in order to match up with those number of environments. So it's easy to get the right functional groups, but the wrong layout overall. So it's always worth bearing that in mind to go and check that. So this question is a quality of written communication question. And what that means is that rather than being one point per mark, we instead have our banded marks for this question. So you've got bands one, two, and three. And in order to get into that top band and to get the full six marks, we need to be having the correct structure to start off. We need to have fully analyzed all of our proton NMR peaks as we did on the previous page. And we need to have at least two supporting statements. So for these supporting statements, one of them would be for our working out for the molecular formula, which we did on the previous page. One of them is for mentioning that we have a ketone because of the fact that we have no peak between nine and 10 parts per million on our proton NMR spectrum. So that would have corresponded to the hydrogen from an aldehyde. So by mentioning that, that's clarify why we picked a ketone, why we put our structure together in this way. And another supporting statement you could mention is the fact that we have the alcohol with this hydrogen here because we lost that peak from our proton NMR spectrum when we added D2O to that because the deuterium replaces that hydrogen and no longer shows up in our proton NMR spectrum. Now, to get four marks out of the six, you would need to include the fact that we've got a carbonyl bond and our alcohol group with supporting statements and having a similar structure, but slightly different laid out. So not all of the peaks matching up to the correct environments overall. And with this whole question in general, we need to be including all of those points which we had listed on our proton NMR spectrum. So we analyze them in full with the peak environment. So that's from our chemical shift. We looked at our splitting by using the M plus one rule. And we looked at our integration, which was given to us next to the peaks. And looking at all of these different bits of information and putting them together, then gives us the structure of L and gets us into the top band to get full marks.